Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh and welcome to an all new pair of Ace in a Day gameplays for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode I shall be reviewing the MB152C1, a tier 2 battery rating 2.3 premium French fighter which was one of the two reward aircraft from the 2018 Festive Quest event. As always, starting with the plane's history, we shall be covering the block MB150 from its inception through to the sub-variant the MB152C1. With that we begin thus. On the 13th of July 1934, the French Air Force issued the C1 design specification for a new, modern, single-seat monoplane fighter. This aircraft was to meet the following requirements. Be armed to a combination of machine guns and cannon, have a retractable undercarriage, and have a top speed close to 483 km an hour or 300 miles per hour. Multiple French aviation firms submitted designs in response to this specification, with Société des Avions Marcel Bloch, or simply Bloch, being one of them. Bloch entered the MB150, an all-metal stress skin design as powered by a 930 horsepower 9 Rome 14 KFS radial engine and armed with two 7.5mm MAC1934 machine guns and two 20mm Hispano Suiza HS404 cannon as mounted in the wings. To demonstrate the potential of the design, Construction work started on the MB150 prototype, designated MB150-01, in September of 1935. Ready for test flights as of 1936, the prototype failed to leave the ground during its inaugural flight in the spring of 1936 due to the combination of its lack of engine power and its limited wing area. As a result, the MB150-01 was unable to demonstrate the potential of the MB150 design, leading to the French Air Force awarding the C1 production contract to Moraine Saunier's MS-406 at the start of 1937. Despite this setback, Bloch was determined to show that the MB-150-01 could fly. In early 1937, several alterations were made to the prototype, including but not limited to the introduction of a strengthened wing with greater surface area, the installation of the 940 horsepower 9 round 14 n 0 radial engine driving a free blade constant speed propeller, and the revision of the plane's undercarriage. These changes proved successful, with the prototype making its inaugural flight as the 29th of September 1937. Upon sending the plane to the Centre de Assesse du Material Aérien, or CIMA, a French Air Force test flight facility in Belize Villa Coublet, for service trials, its performance warranted further development, with the plane achieving a top speed of 434 km an hour or 270 miles per hour in level flight as of December 1937. This further development of the prototype saw a slight increase in the plane's wingspan and the installation of the improved 9 round 14 N7 engine. These changes led to the prototype being redesignated as MB150-01M, the M standing for modified. Further trials were then conducted on the prototype at SEMA, concluding by late spring of 1938. The success of these trials, combined with the French Air Force's rearmament programs in response to the worsening diplomatic situation in Europe, meant the MB150 would be included as part of the French Air Force's production plans. As a result, Following the conclusion of the prototype's further trials, the Société Nationale des Constructions Aéronautiques du Sud, or SNCASO, the aircraft manufacturer into which Bloch had been merged as of the 16th of November 1936, received an order for 25 pre-production aircraft. However, when the design of the MB150-01M was reviewed by SNCASO in preparation for production, it was realised that the design was not fit for mass production. To resolve this, the plane had to be redesigned under the designation of MB151 with its wing area being reduced and the 9 round 14 N11 engine now acting as the plane's power plant. The prototype of the redesigned aircraft, the MB151-01, flew for the first time on the 18th of August 1938. The subsequent test flights revealed that the plane had two key issues which needed to be rectified before it could enter mass production. The first being the overheating of the engine during extended flights, and the second being the poor balance on the plane's pitch or elevator axis at high speeds. In parallel to this, a more powerful variant known as the MB-152 was in development. The main difference between this variant and the MB-151 was the plane's power plant, the 1000 horsepower 9 round 14 N25 engine, later upgraded to the 1120 horsepower 9 round 14 N49 radial engine. With its prototype, MB-152-01, flying for the first time in December of 1938 and proving successful during test flights at SEMA in February 1939, both the MB-151 and MB-152 were commissioned for production. A total of 400 aircraft were to be produced, 60 MB-151s and 340 MB-152s as part of the initial production order. 
Upon entry into service with the French Air Force, the planes were redesignated as MB-151C1 and MB-152C1 respectively, the latter being the plane you're seeing on screen today. Unfortunately, early evaluations of the production aircraft showed they were unsuitable for combat service as the issues previously identified with the MB-151 prototype continued to plague both variants, and all of the aircraft were missing either their gun sights or propellers. To quantify, by the start of the Second World War on the 1st of September 1939, a total of 120 aircraft had been delivered, yet none of the planes were suitable for service. As time progressed, the delivered aircraft became usable, with a total of 144 MB-151s and 482 MB-152s built before the fourth France on the 22nd of June 1940. And so our historical review concluded, let us take a look at the MB-152C1 handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Our first gameplay for today takes place on the ground strike map New Guinea. For this we'll be using the following setup. Stealth belts for both types of armament, the reasoning being in both cases that in my experience these belts are the most powerful out of those available. Our gun convergence is set to 300 meters, noting it's going to affect all types of armament while they're all being based in the wings, and this is for the reason of turn fighting, whereby the characteristics of this plane, as I'll go on to explain, are well suited for turn fighting above all other potential roles. As for our fuel load, we're taking the standard 30 minute fuel load to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscathed on fuel capacity. With that, we begin as always with the plane's climb rate. In the case of the MB-152C1, the climb rate of this aircraft compared to its peers is average at best. It's very well sustained with a climb angle of 25 degrees to the point you can do some very nice long distance climbs. To give you an example, if you start off with a speed of 350 km an hour and an altitude of 1000 meters and use wet cycling and the 25 degree climb angle, you'll be able to take this plane all the way from 1000 meters altitude to 4500 meters altitude in a single climb before needing to level out. This means that when you're the top battery rating aircraft and very few opponents decide to go for altitude, typically bottoming out at 3000 meters altitude, you'll be able to get above them and start to strike from above or control the engagements. But in a battery rating 3.3 game such as this, a good number of opponents will go for altitude, and that leaves you behind in the climb race, because your peers, such as the Ki-44 Mark I, and then at the lower battery rating the Heinkel HE-100D1, will be able to get to 5000 meters altitude by the time you've reached 4000 meters altitude, and when we're seeing the likes of the C-202EC and the P-39K1 Aero Cobra, this differential increases by a gap of 1.25 kilometers, so when you get to 4000 meters altitude, there will be at approximately 5250 meters altitude. When the Messerschmitt 19F1 come up towards us, we need to react, and we decide to break past them via head to head, noting they have the superior firepower for the head on or their nose mounted twin to Marita Cannon, and we take a glance and blow from it. The hammer calls them to overshoot the mark, we now have to reverse the engagement against the P 39K1 Aero Cobra that's come down on top of us, and in doing so much alike in the fashion against the Messerschmitt 19F1, we're now going to go to work on our aggressors. Now it's important to note here the fact we're able to bring down the C202 EC and the P 39K Aero Cobra with the fact they're engrossed in engagements against our allies. If there had been a 1 versus 1 or a 1 versus 2 where well, we're the 1, what we'd find is, if these opponents decide just to simply break away rather than stay in the turn fight against us, they could choose to because they have the superior pace. So we need to keep in mind when we see turn fights where they're not necessarily dedicated 1 versus 1s and our opponents committed to the turn fight as such, that every certain will try to use the situations around us to our advantage in order to take foes by surprise, or alternatively try to make sure we're behind the opponent and at close range a little bit longer than they may have liked, either they're engrossed in something and not able to get away in time before we're able to deliver the damage with our firepower, which as we've seen is rather good. Now the majority of this firepower is going to come in the form of the 220mm cannon, which can deal a great amount of damage but at the same time can prove a little bit unreliable as we're going to see here against the SPD-3 Dauntless. Do keep in mind I'm missing some of my shots here as well, my accuracy is rather rusty, but every so often we would expect perhaps one or two rounds to go in to achieve a critical hit, they just seem to be glancing at the moment when they're hitting the mark. Nonetheless, the Dauntless goes down, we don't pick up the assist, but that's not to matter, and we start to break away a little bit. Now one thing to note about the ammo capacity, you have a lot of machine gun ammunition. You only have 60 rounds per cannon, however, and this means that you do need to manage your ammunition with your cannon, sparingly, because otherwise what can happen is that you'll spend all of your ammunition taking down one foe, and whilst you're in the midst of a cannon reload, you're going to have to go against another foe. And that's going to cause some frustration because you may get a clear shot on target and then you end up only being able to bring your machine guns to bear. Master machine guns can prove effective against biplanes and very early monoplane fighters such as an F2A-1 Buffalo which has no armour whatsoever. Against more durable planes such as a Hurricane Mark 1 Late, you're going to find you'll need to dump a lot of ammunition in it in order to bring them down. 
And speaking of a hurricane, we have one hot on our six right now. And they do have the superior maneuverability, albeit we're trying to get the most out of our own aircraft, try and frustrate their aim for long enough so that way our allies can bring them down. And it looks as though the hurricane is on its last legs as they finally go down to a friendly Heinkel 112B0. And the hurricane out of the way, that gives you an indicator of the sort of maneuverability that we have available to us. Not the best at the battle rating, but still rather strong. And we'll elaborate on that in a second. But for now, having picked up a considerable amount of damage, it's time for us to go land and repair. And this brings us on to the MB152C1's durability. It's a mixed bag, unfortunately. On the plus side, the central fuselage can take a good degree of damage from machine gun caliber armament, and we saw that with the Hurricane there. It took multiple hits, but the plane hasn't fallen out of the sky. But if you look in the bottom left hand corner of your screen at the damage indicator, note where the majority of the damage is concentrated the tail section. This is one of two areas where the MB152C1's durability really lets the plane down, and that the tail section of this plane can very easily come flying off. And it'll only take a one second burst of 12.7mm machine gun fire from the likes of an F2A 3 Buffalo, or alternatively, one or two 20mm cannon shells from the likes of your Codlov Yak 1 to send the entire tail section flying off of the plane. At the other end of the spectrum, when you look towards the engine department, nobody took some damage from the glancing blow of the 20mm cannon of the Messerschmitt 19F1. If it had been a direct hit, it would be very likely we'd lost the engine completely, and this extends all the way through to seeing the likes of the 7.62mm Shikas machine guns on an I-16 Type 18. We only need to take a couple of dedicated hits to the engine before it receives critical damage. So ideally, you need to avoid getting hit at all costs in this plane. If you are going to take hits, make sure that those hits are coming towards the central fuselage and only ready from machine gun caliber armament rather than cannon armament, as cannon are going to rip this plane to pieces. But if you can avoid getting hit wherever possible, that's going to work in your favor. Now what that means is this plane, when we come on to turn fighting, is a bit of a difficult one if you'd like to play within a furball. Because the difficulty is that in the midst of a furball, you cannot typically avoid getting hit. Because there's multiple allies, there's multiple foes, you're switching from one another in terms of who targets who. And it's the case that you're going to be drifting across lines of fire, you're going to get hit by random rounds. And over time, that can prove frustrating. Because this plane is going to fill the damage quite easily. So instead, looking for those one versus ones which you can capitalize on is where this plane is going to thrive. I've been in an isolated engagement where the only time your foe is going to get guns on you is if you do not perform adequately in the midst of that turn fight. Now having taken off, a quick repair there, we're making our way back over to the middle of the battlefield, and we can see that whilst this is a rather slow plane, we're able to get back into the fight due to the limited size of the map. And we're looking towards this Breda 88 who's charging towards us, and we don't want to take too much damage from their incoming 12.7 litre machine guns, the Breda Safat type, if I remember correctly. They've charged past, and this is going to be another demonstration of the lack of speed we have available to us. We're the Breda 88 just charging over our airfield, going for one of our allies in the form of the Key 44 Mark II, and now breaking off into the distance, making their way towards what is the northwest. We're gaining at the moment because we're cutting across their overall trajectory, we're intercepting them. But note how far behind we are. And with our gun convergence set to 300 meters and the target being beyond 600 meters, this means that our convergence is not ideal at all. More of them jutting the nose of their plane up and down to avoid the incoming fire before changing direction. It's going to take too long for us to close the distance. We are gradually getting there, but is it really worth us spending all this time charging after the enemy aircraft when we could be going for other targets and letting our faster allies get the job done, such as the key 44 that broke in on our right hand side? So instead, we decide to go for a reload here and pull back to friendly territory. And let's go further into the turn fighting capabilities. We've talked about the fact this plane is perhaps not well suited to the midst of a furball due to its lack of durability, but not ideal one versus one, what have we got available to us? Well, the turn circle. It's above average. In that, you are going to be beaten by the likes of Hurricane Mark IIb and an I-16 Type 24 at your battle rating, but you can outturn the vast majority of your monoplane fighter opposition when you've got your landing flaps equipped. And you'll be able to equal the likes of the RE2000 C1, the Key 61 Mark I Koenotsu, and the F2A 3 Buffalo. This puts you in a very nice position. In that plane, such as the Yak 1, the MS410, etc., you're going to be out turning those with aplomb, and it means that you can really thrive in the turn fighting engagement against a good number of the adversaries that you'll be seeing. And we've reflected that already in the fact that with this being a higher battle rating game, when you're facing higher battle rating opposition, the turn circles the majority of your foes will start to extend further and further, they become wider and wider. And in return, that means the number of foes that you can lure into that turn fight situation are only going to increase to your advantage. If we then look at the control surfaces, we'll find that the weakest aspect of this plane is its roll rate, which is average at best, and leaves this plane prone to the idea of falling behind when you're in the midst of a turn fight which focuses very heavily on changes in direction. But if it ends up becoming a set of scissors, the roll rate of this plane can let it down somewhat. 
But if we start looking at the more positive control surfaces, the elevator being number two, we find that the elevator of this plane is good and gives it a tight blue circle. Not as good as the likes of the P36G Hawk, but just falling slightly behind. And you'll need to start a loop at 270 km an hour, otherwise you're going to stall mid loop. Finally, coming on to the strongest aspect of this plane, it's rudder. We find that it's got a tight flat rudder turn circle comparable to likes of say a Spitfire Mark 1A's rudder and its associated flat rudder turn circle. And this means that you have an ample supply control surfaces in order to get the job done in the turn fight. And you can feel confident and rather comfortable in this plane in that when you go into a situation, all three control surfaces are going to work together rather than some other aircraft whereby you may have two control surfaces that work in harmony, but the third one holds it back. Now I haven't tried to take some shots at both of them, we saw that we did some damage but not enough and again we're holding ourselves back somewhat with a lack of pace and also the convergence setting we have. And something could be argued in that if you take a 500m gun convergence setting you'll be able to accommodate a bit of an interceptor roll in this plane. However the lack of pace is why I would argue this is perhaps not the most prevalent idea unless you can get used to the idea of getting close to foes and then aiming off centre in order to bring them down. But it's the pilot's choice at the end of the day. Now having covered our control surfaces in the turn fight engagement what really is our ideal speed range in order to be able to achieve these engagements? Well, I would argue it's a case of being between 300 and 450 km an hour. If you go below 250 km an hour, you'll find the elevator of this plane starts to become heavier. But the overall nature of this plane in terms of moving towards stall effect only really comes in in the region of the plane's stall speed of 115 km an hour, which is average of the batter rating because you have to weigh out the fact you face biplanes, early monoplanes, and then some more advanced monoplanes in the batter rating 3.0 region, if not 3.3. But 115 km an hour is nothing to complain about, and we're going to demonstrate the low stall speed here as we decide to cut over the top of this F2A-1 Buffalo, force them into a stall, and we'll be hammerheading over the top, showing the power of our rudder here in cutting over and ripping them out of the sky for another kill. One thing that works well in combination with this idle speed range is the fact that whilst your acceleration is not phenomenal, whether it's having to deal with the Hurricane Mark IV coming down on us, we can't dive away from them because they've got at least equivalent dive speed acceleration, if not better acceleration than a dive. Whilst the acceleration of this plane is not great, it does enable you to get to your ideal speed range rather comfortably. If you just look at straight line acceleration on your engine, you'll be able to go from your stall speed to 325 km an hour at an average rate, and then there is a drop off with more emergency power you can kick this threshold up to 400 km now. The overall boost in your acceleration is not too great to be honest but it's enough to help get you there to the higher end of your idle speed range. In a dive the picture is pretty much the same. You've got below average dive speed acceleration all the way up to 700 km an hour and then it drops off making it very difficult to achieve a dive speed in excess of 750 km an hour and that's why we can't really use a dive to get away from foes or even pull distance or lure them back to friendly territory and it's why we had to react to the A36 Apache who's now gone charging off towards our team's airfield. Our maximum dive speed for reference is 844 km an hour but good luck in achieving that in a dive that's not over an altitude distance in excess of 5000 meters simply because you don't have the dive speed acceleration to get to that point. And I've been able to achieve 844 km an hour from diving up from an altitude of 8,000 meters altitude, just to give you an idea. Having brought down the SM-79, we can see that by bringing down bombers, or alternately attackers, we're doing so when they've decided to submit themselves to low altitude strikes, rather than stay up high, such as that Heinkel 111, and we cannot intercept that plane, or at least not at a decent rate. They're completely out of our reach and we have to let them go, that's something for somebody else to deal with. And now with the I-15 coming towards us, we're going to demonstrate that you can take on some biplanes as well. Although keep in mind the one thing the I-15R pilot does not do here, and that is use their turn circle against us. Instead, this dogfight starts to revolve more in the vertical, and that's where we can equalise somewhat. Whereby they do have the tighter loop circle, but they're not really using a loop to their advantage, and they had made one cut over via a split S there, we're able to stay behind them long enough to get a clear shot on target, we only need to put one 20 mm cannon round in by looks of things, and that's enough to knock out their pilot or perhaps it was just some machine gun ammunition going in there. But nonetheless, that's our sixth and final kill of this match, as we now break back into friendly territory, and we see that our team's tickets are going to diminish shortly. We go for another reload, just in case another foe comes in. And what's quite funny is you can see that AIR-81C off in the distance on the enemy team. If you fancy checking out my review of that aircraft, using the link in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now, you'll see that the two planes are rather equivalent. or well, the IARR being a tier two, battery rating 2.7, premium Italian fighter. Nonetheless, post-game stats time. By primarily employing our MB-152C1 in the turn fighter role, 
and taking advantage of a couple of opportunities to intercept some low-flying enemy bombers, we're able to pick up 6 kills, netting us 17,240 silver lions and 4,065 research points. The key points that we can take from this first gameplay are the lack of pace in the MB-152C1, particularly when it's facing light flight battery rate in opposition, or higher battery rate in opposition, as was the case here. We do not normally have the ability to initiate engagements as such, and instead it's going to be our opponents will have that initiative, and we have to try and reverse the engagement to our advantage. But every so often, thanks to the ability for the MB-152C1 to gain a lot of altitude over time, we may be presented with the opportunity to come down on top of a foe, or at least achieve parity when we're both going into the engagement, I, us and them, and then proceed to take advantage for our superior manoeuvrability. Albeit, we do have to keep in mind some foes will have equal, if not superior, manoeuvrability to us, particularly the biplanes we'll see at the lower battle rating end, and on top of that, the likes of the Hurricane Mark IIbs that we'll see at the same battle rating. But now we're going to be moving on to our second gameplay for today, where we're going to be seeing a rather similar case. We're in a battle rating 3.0 game, we're going to be reacting to a lot of foes, trying to get our foes into turn fights where possible, and every so often perhaps relishing the opportunity to conduct a light amount of boom and zoom or interception attacks. With that, let's get into it. Our second and final gameplay for today is on the ground strike map fjords, using the same setup as before. We changed our camouflage pattern this time to the early camouflage pattern, rather than the standard one that comes with the plane. It should be noted that the early camouflage pattern could be unlocked as part of the 2018 Festive Quest event as well, and I personally prefer it, but that's down to pilot's preference, not what makes the plane better. We're going to start off this match in the same manner as with the first one, using the sustainable climb rate of the MB-152C1 in order to get as much altitude as possible, and then react to the situations that we find up at medium to high altitude, whereas aggressors coming towards us, and alternatively planes down low that we can start to pick on. As we go to altitude, let's talk about the maximum altitude limits of this aircraft and the overall ideal altitude range. What you'll find is the maximum altitude limits on the engine for this aircraft are rather interesting. At 3000 meters altitude, there is a gradual acceleration drop off for straight line acceleration, but not on the base engine power. Instead, it's on the acceleration with more emergency power active. We mentioned previously that the threshold was 400 km an hour. At 3000 meters altitude, this actually starts to drop to the point at 3500 meters altitude, you're already down to a threshold limit of 380 km an hour. It's when you get to 5000 meters altitude that you'll see a drop off in base engine performance, where both the straight line acceleration and the climb rate of this plane are heavily impacted from that point onwards. Now adding to that about control surfaces, the maximum altitude limit for your control surfaces is 4000 meters, at which point a heaviness is added to the elevator in particular, and this will cause your turn circle to widen considerably. Now immediately you may be thinking, well okay, so that puts our ideal altitude limit at zero, i.e. ground level, all the way up to 4000 meters. Well I would argue actually the maximum point of that is 3000 meters altitude, simply because at your battery rating there are two factors you need to consider. Number one, at a battery rating of 2.3, you rarely see engagements occur above 3,000 meters altitude, or if you're really pushing it 4,000 meters altitude, which means the maximum limit of 3,000 meters is going to be well suited for this plane and make it very comfortable within its battle rating range. Number two is the fact that when you go to higher and higher altitudes, there are a good number of foes at your battle rating and higher battle ratings which see increasing performance from their own aircraft. Examples include the Key 44s and the MiG 3s. And if you look at a higher battle rating plane such as the P47D Thunderbolts, well, the picture only becomes clearer. That means as you go with increasing altitude, you're actually putting yourself at the limit of your performance and open up an advantage to your opponent in terms of their net overall performance. But at 3000 meters altitude, you're at your maximum performance, whereas your opponents are going to be starting to push towards their maximum of their ideal performance range, but you're not quite giving them the taste of that ideal performance, so it'll work to your advantage. Hence that maximum limit of 3000 meters for the ideal altitude range in my opinion. Whereas if we look towards the minimum point, we could say it's ground level, but I would argue it's actually 1000 meters altitude for a final factor. Which is below 1000 meters altitude, you will see the climb rate of this plane drop by 10% approximately. Now it's nothing major to worry about, because if you're in the midst of a turn fight, your typical engagement style on this aircraft, the climb rate dropping by 10% is not going to have a major impact, unless it's a very tight engagement where it's gone into a climbing spiral, and you find you're fighting another one of these aircraft or somebody with a very similar style of climb rate. But again, that's the exception and not the norm. So as a result, you could argue that yes, it's ground level up to 3000 meters, but if you really want to get the most out of this plane, then I would argue in the case of 1000 to 3000, which again, is very well suited to the battery rate of the aircraft 2.3. I mean, so this plane is going to feel very comfortable regardless of the games you go into, simply because you'll be performing at maximum performance pretty much at all times. 
Now here you can see that we've gone for a reload on our 20mm cannon just before we engage the A36. And this is to highlight that ammo management is key and knowing when to go for a reload versus when not to go for a reload is going to be critical to you picking up kills or losing kills in this case for the MB152C1. So do keep that in mind. And with that, we can see that the skies around us are pretty much clear now up at higher altitudes in terms of opponents because nobody's decided to climb any further than the A36 and it means we have the initiative for once and we need to make the most of it. And I say that because the energy retention of this plane in both the straight line and vertical is poor to the extent that you're only going to get one opportunity to conduct boom and zoom. Focusing on the vertical then, it's poor in the fact that you're only going to return to your original state in a boom and zoom dive with a return angle of 30 degrees over a 950 meter altitude dive distance. And we're going to cut down the F4F Wildcat here to show the lethality of this plane in a limited boom and zoom before cutting through. As we break away, with that in mind, in terms of just engine power alone, it gives you a 950 meter diving potential distance. With War Emergency Power Active, you can extend this range to 1,500 meters. So you can imagine if you start off at a speed of 300 km now and 4,000 meters altitude, you dive all the way down a 90 degree dive angle to 2,500 meters and then go back up a return angle of 30 degrees. With War Emergency Power Active, you'll be able to get back to your starting point. But that means you're WEP dependent for boom and zoom, which is not always a nice thing because you start to become addicted to using more emergency power to achieve boom and zoom tactics, and you may find you actually need your more emergency power to get you out of a sticky situation. And that comes in due to the fact that the straight line energy retention of the MB152C1 is incredibly poor. In that, you're only able to start holding onto your speed when you come out of a dive and fly in a straight line at 430 km an hour which means even biplanes such as the Gloucester Gladiator will be able to keep up with you for a good period of time when you're trying to run away in a straight line after coming out of a dive. And this means that most foes that are monoplane fighters will just simply be able to follow you. Regardless of whether you try to get away or not, they'll close the distance and then force you into a turn fight or just shoot you down from behind your six. So it means once you commit to a situation whereby you're going to have foes chasing you, you're going to have to turn it into a turn fight and reverse the situation or expect to start being ripped apart. Now we achieved an assist there on the DB3B and we're now starting to look around for the next foe. But with the skies around us clear and we're back in friendly territory, albeit there's a lag free up on high, we're now going to start making our way back into the centre of the map and trying to move more towards the turn fighter fashion. Unless nobody arises, then we'll be going back up to altitude and trying to take the initiative once again. And this is where we come into the concept of the energy retention of this plane being very well suited for turn fighting. In that it's average, but your bleed speed in a dedicated turn with no flaps active until 300 km an hour, which means you can hold a good amount of speed in the turn. If you engage your landing flaps, keeping in mind you have no combat flaps available, you have to use landing flaps in order to tighten your turn circle in this plane, you'll hold on to your speed to 250 km an hour, which is perfect for the simple reason it's only when you go below 250 km an hour that you get heaviness on your elevator, and that's where you start to lose out in the turn circle race, either turn circle widen or the widening or the heaving of the elevator, I should say. We bring down the F4U1 Corsair there, who overshot the mark, and we used our superior maneuverability and ability to keep a lower speed there in order to get onto their six. So that horizontal energy retention in mind, it means the only time you're really going to become frustrated in the turn fight, and you'll see yourself really start to lose energy, is if your opponent forces you into a climbing spiral whilst you've got landing flaps active, because then you're guaranteed to bleed more and more speed going into the vertical. But even then, with the stall speed of 115 km an hour, which you mentioned previously is average, it's not too much of a problem. And one other thing we haven't considered is the fact your stall recovery is rather good, in that your nose will drop gradually when you enter a stall, and your speed will need to build to 185 km an hour for you to regain control of the aircraft. But in return, you'll lose very little altitude in this aircraft, no more than 50 meters altitude, unless you're stalling out at an altitude of, say, 4,500 meters, and then you lose about 100 meters altitude in similar circumstances. But with this package is together to define why this plane is quite a capable turn fighter, and that's its primary role, I would argue, or what we're trying to use it for. Simply because all the characteristics are leaning one way, and you can use it as an interceptor. There's no question about that. We've seen that. You can use it for boom and zoom. We have seen that. But that would be playing against what this plane can do very well. And it's really using it in those boom and zoom and intercept roles that you'll do every so often when the situation arises. And that's the point I'm trying to emphasize here, that there is one key role, but every so often you'll want to creep into those other roles, but do keep in mind the limiting factors. And here's an example again. With this V156F off in the distance, we're chasing after them very gradually. Note that we've got three enemy planes on the horizon, which are two kilometers out compared to our target, but we're chasing a foe that's heading away from us. We've got the Typhoon that's coming charging in, albeit they've crashed into our friendly I-15. And we've still got the Buffalo and the PE-3 to deal with. But these foes, by the time we get to the V156, if we decide to dive on them, they would be on top of us. 
So instead we've held back and we're going to take the initiative here by being able to dive down on the opposition and take them on rather than let them dive down on us. So a little bit of thinking needs to go into this and the buffalo is now coming up towards us. So we're going to come down on top of them but we're going to frustrate their incoming fire rather than sacrifice our plane's potential in the head to head and we'll force them to stall out on our six. Alternatively, if they go down to lower altitude, we'll go into the turn fight because we're confident in our maneuverability, which is at least equal to the buffalo, if not slightly superior in some regards, albeit their roll rate is superior. Now coming on to the six here, we're going to try and wait for the ideal shot rather than just spraying automatically. We're going to get nice and close, bleed them out some speed, get our speed down as well because you can notice how our control surfaces are locking up to a degree, and that's something we haven't considered yet. What happens to our control surfaces with increasing speed so going into a dive? Let's start off with the roll rate here. What you find is between 600 and 700 km an hour, you will lose 10% of your roll rate. It's not an issue as such, and this is mitigated to an extent by the weak dive acceleration of the plane. More importantly, however, with regards to your rudder, what you'll find is between 500 and 700 km an hour, you will lose 50% of your rudder's capability. And this means you lose the ability to be precise in a dive. And you'll note earlier when we dove on that wild camp, that they were pretty much on the verge of a stall, which meant we had to achieve a very little adjustment in order to pick up the kill. And that was the ideal circumstance, our opponents are not going to move out of the way or have the ability to react to us. The final control surface domain, the elevator, experiences no lockup in a dive, meaning that you can just pull out of a dive whenever you're ready, with no impact to the performance, making this plane very receptive to the idea of using dives to build up speed and just simply leveling out or conducting a loop. If you do find there's a opponent diving on you, you've got a bit of time and you want to conduct a quick loop to get onto their six, whereas their looping potential may be constrained as they go to higher and higher speeds. And that fills in the picture there in terms of the lockup thresholds, and we saw how we had to mitigate that against the buffalo. Now breaking back towards friendly territory once again, having dealt with the foe and we were hoping to pick up the V156 but they got dispatched by one of our allies. Is there anything else to note with regards to the MB152C1? Well, one thing I would argue is this is a very comfortable plane. And what you've seen over the course of these two gameplays hopefully, more so I think in this second one, is how when this plane is played carefully you can really pick up the kills over time. And it will be the case that when you're going up against the higher battery rate in opposition, again this being a 3.0 game, the previous one being a 3.3 game, you're going to have to think about, okay, what are my opponent's strengths? And most of them are going to have the same strength of speed and the straight line acceleration. But what are your strengths in terms of your ability to close the distance and get into that turn fight situation? How can you surprise your foes? And here I'm surprising the Spitfire Mark 1A simply because I've crept in behind them whilst they're in the midst of another engagement, using the attention of my ally to take the attention away from me. And it's by taking this gradual approach that you'll start to see your kills build up. At the other end of the spectrum, what's funny is when you go into those batter rating matches where you're the top batter rating plane and seeing primarily biplanes, this plane has to, in a degree, be used as a boom and zoom or an interceptor, where you can use it for head ons, but you'll need a longer distance convergence. Now, these aren't shown here because I found the majority of my games, about 75% of them, have been higher batter rating than this plane. Maybe the times I've been playing at. But in general, by sticking more towards that turn fighter approach, it's been working very well as we finish off by killing off this PE free early right at the end of the match. And with that, it's time to take a look at the post game stats. Again, by deploying the MB152C1 in primarily a turn fighting capacity, but also realising that we had more space in this second game to use this plane in the position of initiative and therefore employ interception or boom and zoom tactics, we were able to pick up 8 kills and the single assist, netting us 43,911 silver lines and 6,804 research points. When facing the MB152C1 in a one on one engagement, I can recommend one or two approaches to defeating this aircraft. The first primarily applies to its monoplane fighter opposition, whereby the majority of said aircraft, examples including the AC-1, the C-202 and the P-40E-1, will simply be able to outrun the MB-152C-1 in both a straight line and in a short distance climb. As a result, hit and run tactics can prove rewarding, so long as you stick to the mantra of hitting hard and fast and not letting yourself be drawn into a turn fight with this aircraft. This approach may be embodied through tactics such as boom and zoom strikes and head-ons, with the latter being more effective if your plane's armament is concentrated solely in the nose, an example being the MiG-334, as your plane's armament will not be convergence dependent, whereas the armament of the MB-152C1 will be. If your strikes prove unsuccessful and you do find yourself caught in the turn fight with the MB-152C1, your best means of escape will be to go into an extreme dive, as the MB-152C1's below average dive speed acceleration will allow you to quickly pull away. 
Moreover, once you've leveled out from your dive, the poor straight line energy retention of this aircraft will prevent them from maintaining their pursuit, granting you a clean getaway. The alternative approach applies to the planes which can at least match, if not surpass, the MB-152C1's turn circle. This extends to planes such as the Ki-61 Mark I Co, the RE-2000 Siri-1, and all the biplanes this aircraft can encounter. Whilst the MB-152C1 is a capable turn fighter, it should be noted that its average roll rate makes it susceptible to manoeuvres focused around the plane's roll axis, such as rolling scissors. Over time, the MB-152C1 can start to fall behind in such manoeuvres and end up overshooting into the gun sight of its opponent. If your plane naturally has a tighter turn circle, this should also be factored in and used to your advantage. In the instance that both your plane's roll rate and turn circle are similar to the MB-152C1, the example here being the Heinkel HE-112A0, you can also seek to exploit the heaviness that is added to the MB-152C1's elevator below 250 km an hour. While your own aircraft may also experience a degree of elevator heaviness at low speeds, keep in mind that if the MB-152C1 pilot wants to rebuild their speed to remove this issue, they will need to disengage their landing flaps, leading to their turn circle becoming wider. This may give you an advantage for a brief period of time, subject to how well you have managed your own energy state within your aircraft. To wrap up, let's first recap the strengths and weaknesses of the MB-152C1. Its main strengths are Number 1. Turn fighting capability With its above average turn circle, moderate energy retention in the horizontal and well-rounded set of control surfaces, the MB-152C1 can comfortably turn fight with most of its monoplane fighter opposition. Just be aware of the fact that you can see biplane opponents who will easily outturn you. Number 2. Ample firepower the plane's wing-mounted combination of two 7.5mm MAC 1934 machine guns and two 20mm HS404 cannon will enable you to down opponents rapidly when you have a clear shot on target. However, do keep in mind the need to manage the ammo count of your 20mm cannon, as these will be delivering the majority of the damage. And number three, suitable ideal altitude range. With the majority of engagements occurring below 3,000m altitude at the MB-152C1's battle rating, the plane's ideal altitude range of 1,000 to 3,000 meters means you'll typically be able to extract maximum performance from the aircraft's engine and control surfaces in each engagement. As for its key weaknesses, number one, generally slow. With its limited acceleration in both a straight line and in a dive, its poor straight line energy retention, and average climb rate, the MB-152C1 will normally have to react to incoming opponents rather than be the initiator of an engagement. This also means that most opposition i.e. monoplane fighters, can easily choose when to disengage. And number two, low durability. Whilst hits to the MB-152C1's airframe from machine guns can be taken to an extent, hits from cannon will quickly spell the plane's demise. Moreover, both the plane's engine and tail section are highly susceptible to receiving damage, with the tail section prone to breaking off at a moment's notice. As for my final opinion of the aircraft, the MB-152C1 makes for a rather comfortable turn fighter, which has the manoeuvrability to gain the upper hand against most of its monoplane opposition, before swiftly bringing them down thanks to its potent armament. Yet beyond this type of engagement, the MB-152C1 will struggle noticeably through the combination of its lack of pace and poor energy retention in both the vertical and the straight line. As a result, the MB-152C1 will prove enjoyable to those who love the challenge of reacting to incoming opponents, that can trigger a case of flyer's block in those who would prefer a more flexible fighter. With that, that is all I've got time for today. For my next review in two weeks' time, i Sunday the 24th of February 2019, I intend to review either number 1, the RE2001 Serie 1, a Tier 2 battery rating 2.3 Italian fighter, or number 2, the F2A-1 Buffalo, a Tier 1 battery rating 2.0 American fighter. Which of these two aircraft I review is entirely up to you. You can cast your vote by using the hyperlink in the description of this video. Poland will close at 1200 hours GMT on Sunday the 17th of February 2019. But as always, I've been TX141. If you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, as always, take care and good luck in the skies.